Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, how many students are in the house today? That's good. This is for you. Um, so I'm here to talk about Space 10, but before I get into that and just to put it in context, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and uh, how I came to lead IKEA's Global Innovation Lab and found it as well. And I should not walk over there, so I stay over here. <laughs> Um, so I grew up in Copenhagen, I was crazy about a lot of things, but these two in particular, I really loved anything that has speeds and wheels on them, like things that go fast, I still do, and the other thing was dancing, my mom had a dance school, so I grew up dancing, and uh, I'm still also doing a lot of that, and it's sort of a... Uh, put me in a dilemma in school. Uh, I started feeling that sitting down all day, getting taught uh, how to live my life, how to think and how to adapt to society was not the way forward for me. And in the end of high school, I got a new friend who introduced me to two things that sort of transformed my life uh, immensely. And one was uh, philosophy, in this case Nietzsche, uh, and other existentialists that I really, really got inspired by. Um, and LSD, and those two together was a very interesting um, combination, and they made me think about something that Nietzsche also said, that you should always live for the sake of self-transformation. And I realized that I, you know, actually didn't know who I was, and I think this is another favorite of mine, Søren Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher, and he said the most common form of despair is not being who you are. And I realized that I actually didn't know who I was because I was, probably as most of us, raised to just adapt to society's norms. And I started questioning those a lot. And I realized that I didn't know who I was and why I was put on this earth, and I needed to figure out uh, what to do with that. And I realized that I was probably not going to go the traditional way. Uh, I was not going to take a further education. Uh, my parents were not too happy about that. They thought it was a waste of good potential. Um, but what I decided to do was to take the inheritance that I had from my granddad, travel the world for four years, and do the school of life. And uh, my dad he used to say that he thought it was a very weird thing to be on a vacation for four years. Um, but it turned out that I think in my uh, personal experience that it really opened up my mind to other cultures and to understanding that life was not necessarily the way that I was brought up to believe it was. And uh, through those four years, I kind of came to terms with why I was here and who uh, I felt that I was. And what I came uh, to understand was that I wanted to spend my um, my life, really, creating spaces for people to unfold their full potential. Another thing that I wanted to do was to lead social change through art, culture, and design. I do believe that those three areas of, uh, you could say, intervention are some of the most powerful because we connect to them emotionally, and it's in many ways what sort of leads us forward. And then finally, I wanted to support the rebel spirit and build communities. And uh, the rebel spirit to me is very important because that is where the future change makers come from. If we are not rebellious, if we do not uh, really question status quo, nothing will change. And we have seen that through history. And we need to see that again now. We're living in times of big transformations, as we all know, why we're here today as well. So in 2006, I started my first company, Art Rebels, a cultural design studio, and it has since developed into a few more companies. Um, and now moving into how I met IKEA and how we get, got to set up their global innovation lab. In 2014, I got a call from IKEA of Sweden asking if I would do a talk about Art Rebels Trailer Park Festival, which was a festival I started, and how we build communities and how we work with creatives in new ways and how we use design to, to, to do change. And uh, that led to the CEO asking me if uh, I could work for IKEA, what would I do? And um, at that time, IKEA, to me, was a design company that 
did home furnishing, and of course my answer was that we would design a collection for them, in this case a limited collection for young people living in small spaces, and we wanted it to be more sustainable. We had all these different aspirations. Um, it wasn't actually mind-blowing, but it became hugely successful for IKEA, and uh, because of that, I got a phone call a year after this collection came out. And this is Tobbe, this is the global CEO, and he called me and wanted to congratulate us on the success of this collection. And then he said, Carla, I'm sitting in the airport of New York. I've been thinking about you all week. Um, since you met me the first time, I became the global CEO of Inside IKEA Systems. You don't know what it is, but it is the owner of IKEA brand, concept, and franchise. And he said, I want to design a bit IKEA for the future. I came to think about you. I don't have a plan, I don't have an agenda, but think about it, get back to me if you have any ideas of how to support that mission. And I was reacting like the guy down in that picture. I was like, whoa, okay. That did not just happen, it did happen. Um, and the first time I pitched the guy an idea, I got the contract within a month, and it wasn't even a real pitch. It was the easiest pitch ever, so this time I thought, okay, we're gonna go all in. So we went to the war room. It kind of did not look like that. We were only two people in the war room. And uh, it was just us brainstorming, me and my colleague Simon, about how could we help transform IKEA. And to do that, we started researching IKEA deeply. And, and we had a lot of ideas. We also had a lot of excitement because we realized that they're actually doing quite a lot of good stuff in the world. They're not just the bad guys that produce you know, lineal, sort of low pricing furniture that we throw away, uh, at least here in the, in the Western world. Um, they also had a lot of really nice visions. And the main visions of IKEA, when I found that one day researching, that's when it all came together. Because IKEA has a vision called creating a better everyday life for the many people. And I think no company can really argue their own vision, but you would definitely argue that producing affordable home furnishing is not the answer to this vision anymore. And we wanted to challenge them in this vision. So what we came up with was how to work with the IKEA vision of creating a better everyday life for the many people, but beyond home furnishing. So what we proposed was to do a future living lab that would work with the vision but not do any home furnishing. We would not look at design, we would not look at current business. We would basically ask what would IKEA be doing 10, 20 years from now if they were not in home furnishing but had to live up to their vision. I pitched the guy the idea and to make a long story short, in three months we had a contract with IKEA, in IKEA Systems, to set up a future living lab fully dedicated to IKEA as a nonprofit, fully funded by them, for three years. And uh, that became Space 10. We have our headquarters in the meatpacking district of Copenhagen. Uh, we are expanding to India in a month. And we have had pop-ups all over the world for periods of time when they made sense. So what are we? We're a future living lab on a mission to design better and more sustainable ways of living. So we are aligned with the IKEA vision. We just added sustainable uh, to make that a point, a very important point in anything that we do. And so why Space 10? And why did IKEA find this interesting? Well, as we know, the world is changing extremely fast around us. And any big company, any big giant as IKEA, and probably some of you here today, have a really hard time transforming and knowing how to transform and adapt. So they really like the idea of understanding what could IKEA potentially venture into if they were not doing what they did today. And how could they potentially start creating an ecosystem of new brands that were thought completely different from the get-go, uh, because actually redesigning and transforming an old giant is close to impossible. So maybe that's not the way forward. Maybe the way forward is to start designing the new and not fighting the old. So we tapped into the five main macro trends that IKEA thought was the, or is, the most disruptive for the current business and also those that leaves probably the biggest opportunities. So accelerate, accelerating urbanization, 
political and economic shifts. I don't have time to go into these, but you also know them. Lack of natural resources, very uh, big topic today, I guess, as well. And very important when it comes to IKEA's current business model. Demographic shifts, another really interesting thing that's happening in the world is getting older and younger at the same time. And we are growing exponentially uh, in human capacity. <laughs> And technological breakthroughs, which is also a big part of the future transformation that we need to see. But what we do wish at Space 10 is to not create a future where technology and digital uh, actually makes us addicts and create this kind of future. So we often say it's not about what technology can do for us, but indeed also who are we becoming using these new technologies. And I think we have a lot to learn when it comes to this. So to sum it up, we strive to see patterns where most would see chaos. Now, I'm gonna take a little bit deeper and behind the scenes of how we work and how we influence IKEA. So we set up labs, and a lab is defined if it has the potential to create a better everyday life for the many people, if it's far enough for IKEA's current business to qualify as concept innovation, if it's close enough to complement the IKEA vision, and finally, if it has a high potential to be a new sustainable business model for IKEA. The method of how we work is how I've always worked, also how I build Art Rebels. It's basically a collaborative approach. We want to be a small in-house team. We are today at Space 10, 30 people, which is very little compared to the ambitions and the projects that we run. But we are able to do that because we elevate our capacity and our competences through these networks. So we have residencies. They are often super smart students who come and stay with us, help us research for a period of time, anything from a month to a year. We have collaborators, which are studios, digital studios, architect studios, design studios from around the world, the best in class. Uh, and we work with those depending on what project we're working with. And finally, we always engage with the wider community because, as was mentioned earlier, change needs to happen everywhere. It needs to happen privately in the private sector from IKEA. I do think there are bad guys that need to change. Um, it needs to happen from the way we consume. Yes, we also have that responsibility. And of course, government needs to regulate. So community is really where we can engage with people and get them excited about what we do. We have a saying, it is if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And uh, we should all have that mentality, I think. Then we are more open and curious towards each other. We work with a very sort of simple innovation tunnel model. We start exploring, we prototype, and then we pilot if it makes sense, if our prototypes are in any shape or form meaningful and successful. And then we have these tools that we use to go through the tunnel. Residences, space program, which is basically where we engage with the larger communities through events like this. Playful research, well, I will show you a very powerful tool for Space 10. I would also call it the activistic tool that I believe has uh, a lot of uh, power in also influencing IKEA. Storytelling, which is connected to playful research, and Space IO, which is all our digital tools and interfaces where we connect with both IKEA and the people around us. We're currently running five labs, one around future food, one around shared living, so how can IKEA potentially build housing that is sustainable, affordable, and livable? When we say livable, we mean communal. How can I, uh, we work with natural interfaces, designing technology that are in more uh, empowering and also better to engage with than what we see today, more natural to engage with? Solar energy, which is exploring how IKEA could move into the energy sector, sector especially in emerging economies, um, and how we can use blockchain technologies to sort of democratize energy consumption. And finally, we have open fabrication, where we're exploring how can digital fabrication, local manufacturing, potentially disrupt the way IKEA produces home furnishing today. I'm going to use the food. Uh, example in my last minutes here to show you through the funnel of, uh, of Space 10. So exploration start wide. We wanted to explore the future of food. IKEA is uh, a bad guy when it comes to food. One thing is that they produce a lot of cheap home furnishing that uses a lot of raw materials. 
but they actually also serve a billion meatballs a year. And uh, that's a lot of meatballs, and they're not good for the environment. So the very first project we started, playful research project we started when we started Space 10, was called Tomorrow's Meatball. So we basically hacked IKEA's meatballs. And we took a food chef, a graphic designer, and some concept development in the mix, and then we came up on this project that we call Tomorrow's Meatball, which was basically projecting eight future food trends that came out of the UN food report. The recommendations of how we could tackle climate change when it comes to food and agriculture. And uh, we sent these little stories to the press, and it went completely viral overnight. And there were headlines in all the biggest medias in the world saying that IKEA was now taking off the meatballs off the menu. They were not. We had not even told them about the project. Uh, and we freaked out in the morning, for sure, when we saw the press uh, amount of the press, because we were like, OK, they're going to close us down. That was too much. But it turned out that they were the cool Swedish company that actually thought that it was kind of fun. And they called us, the head of the global communication, he said, can we just agree that next time you do something like this, you call me in advance, because all stores around the world right now are freaking out, because they get called by local press and don't know about Space 10, have never heard of tomorrow's meatballs, and don't know what to answer. So basically, we were like, OK, when you touch core business, we need to know two weeks in advance so we can actually inform our markets, which I thought was kind of fair. So um, we did not get closed down. We could move on. And we wanted to basically ask ourselves, what if we could grow tasty, nutritious food locally and make it accessible, affordable, and sustainable for the many? And we zoomed in. So we didn't, we were like, we can't do all eight future food trends. But we want to do one. We want to do urban farmers' ball. That was the one direction that we thought could be very interesting to look deeper into and basically see how could we grow food locally. Again, we wanted to use design and what we call playful research to sort of spark conversation. So we did the second playful research, which was the grow room, which is a sort of an urban architectural structure that grows food. And it's also a social space. And we exhibited this as a, at a big art fair in Copenhagen. And again, it was the most popular piece uh, in the exhibition for, also for press. And we sent it out to press, and again, it went viral. We got a lot of re requests to send this beautiful structure around the world to different conferences and museums. Um, and we decided that that was probably not the most sustainable thing to do. However, we connected it to the open fabrication lab that we were also running, and we went back to the drawing board. And we made a version that was actually uh, suitable to be produced locally in one material, local available material, on demand, and free. So it was open source, and we sent that news to the press with these new drawings, and it became the most shared post on Huffington Post Facebook in 17. And we started receiving these food-producing domes from all over the world. And uh, it was kind of amazing to receive these. This is one of my favorites. It's from a U.S. Christian, I don't know, Instagram, that they write, we hope, we have hope of the resurre resurrection of Jesus. And I think this is the uh, next level for me. Um, <laughs> and, and they didn't put food in, but, you know, <laughs> never mind. So we've received more than 400 different domes around the world. And what it showed us was that there was an excitement about growing food locally. They also showed us that people were willing to go to a local makerspace and, and cut out these structures and build them on their own, which was very interesting on another level. Anyway, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed talk now. We realized that, OK, it was time to move into prototyping. So we've been exploring. We've been doing playful research. We've been starting conversations and sort of starting pushing IKEA from the outside in through these activistic tools um, and these media storms that we created uh, on them, almost, I would say. And then we went into hydroponic. So now we can scale. This is scalable. So we set up a farm in the basement of Space 10. We invited a bioengineer from India called Keenan, and we got him to help us put sensors to the system so that it was easier to understand how to grow different crops. 
The beauty of vertical farming, if you don't know, is that you can grow all year round, you harvest every 10 weeks, you use 90% less water, and if you run this system on solar energy, it's fully sustainable. This is quite amazing. And a lot of places where we are running out of water, we have a lot of sun, and we have a very hard time doing agriculture. So it might not be that relevant here, but in many places it could be. We then connected it to technology and ask ourselves, how can we engage with this in an easier way? How can it become more accessible for more people? Because it's actually really hard to grow vertically. So he made a talk to Google Home. But what are you growing? According to our Farmer Sebastian's journal, I'm growing microgreens like cress, kale, radish, and lentils, but also full-sized vegetables like lettuce and mizuna. I don't like the way lentils taste. Can you make them taste better? He made them talk to us, the plants, which was kind of cool. And we used, a, we used AI to sort of make that intelligence grow over time. We then decided to start designing how would it look if IKEA started growing food locally and also distributing food locally. And we called it Local, Swedish for local. And we started designing the website, the packaging, so actually making it really real for them. We also went to London Design Week, where we launched the first sort of real version uh, of how a future salad bar could look, where we grow food on uh, location of where we serve it. And we served more than 2,000 of these very delicious microgreen salads. Uh, and we invited IKEA in. And the whole project started winning a lot of design awards, both Frame and Fast Company, within sort of sustainability, innovation, and new retail. And so, to say the least, we got IKEA really, really excited about this, and also very high level. And uh, what happened was that we were now ready to move into pilot, and we got IKEA's investment board excited as well. They invested 20 million euros, uh, euros in this project in the US called AeroFarms because they wanted to try and scale uh, growing food and, uh, and doing it vertically. Um, we started imagining how the future of IKEA's rooftop could look like. And uh, basically, recently this came out that IKEA has now grown lettuce in shipping containers on its stores and the CEO of Inca, which is all the markets, the global markets, went out four months ago or so, Jesper Prodin, and told the global press that within three years, all IKEA stores would grow vertically. And, uh, and I think that's pretty nice that we have managed to move them there in a year and a half. So you can also, if you're more curious to see how you can take these microgreens and make really delicious uh, food out of it, go and get our Future Food Today uh, cookbook, which just came out a month ago. So just to sum up very fast, what do we do? We experiment and co-create new ways of designing for a better future. We look into new directions and explore emerging potential. We work with a global collaborative network of experts and forward-thinking partners. We test and try new ideas in, and solutions in a non-commercial environment. And finally, we storytell and share what we do to spark discussion, make ideas sticks, and move people to action. Because we really do believe that there is no innovation without a great story. Thank you very much.